Okay, uh, maybe we can get started then and then people can trickle in. So thanks very much for joining the first ever site masterclass. Uh, I'm going to give a, a little bit of a different talk than my normal one, just because I think uh, maybe some people on this call have already heard that. I'm very excited to be joined by uh, Dr. Abisar Whiting, Michelle, uh, the editor in chief of Research Square. Uh, she's going to be giving a talk on her research, her background, uh, how sh they are using site. Uh, with their their publications um and we've been on panels before so it's really a, a privilege to be on a, another panel together uh, i will um go first and give a little bit of an introduction on myself on why we created site uh, how we built site and, and kind of you know what we've accomplished so far and how it can help uh, in your research whether you're a student uh, a, a postdoc a professor or a librarian um, and then we'd really encourage i would say questions throughout uh, so please use the Q&A. Uh, we are recording this. We will post this to our YouTube channel afterwards and then send this as a follow-up. Uh, and so we will share this with people that were not able to make this. Um, and you can share that uh, externally or internally with your, your colleagues. Um, and so thanks again. Uh, my name is Josh Nicholson. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Site. Uh, my email is on the screen, uh, which is josh at site.ai. Uh, our Twitter handle is at site. Uh, please do uh, tweet at us or email me directly if you have questions or, or feedback even uh, after this. And then I would encourage people on the call to, you know, kind of sign up on site and, and play along as we go through the talk. And so today I want to start by kind of, you know, giving you a journey of my own research career uh, and, you know, how site started and why it started. So about seven years ago at this point, most of my time was spent creating movies like this. And so I did a lot of microscopy looking at cancer cells, non-cancer cells, and human cells dividing. And so you can see the, the chromosomes uh, dividing uh, in, in the mitosis here in this image. And so I was, you know, uh, uh, looking at, at cell biology, uh, but I was also thinking about uh, how we are funded, how uh, we publish our research, uh, and all these things that are sometimes seen as, you know, kind of extracurricular to research, uh, you know, I, but I think is integral. And so during this time when I was looking at, you know, these, these chromosomes dividing, a, a paper came out in Nature uh, back in 2012. This Nature commentary got a lot of attention, including attention from myself. Uh, and what it looked at was over the course of, you know, about 10 years, uh, researchers from Amgen, a large pharma, sought to reproduce uh, major uh, cancer findings. So they took uh, studies from the literature uh, and then spent a lot of money, a lot of time, first trying to validate them in-house before trying to you know, develop drugs based on them. And so the findings were pretty shocking because what the Amgen paper found, and so the one on the right, was that you know, out of these 53 major cancer studies, and these are you know, not kind of studies that no one's heard of, but really major ones, 89% uh, could not uh, be confirmed. They could not be reproduced. Um, and this, you know, built upon previous research that was also done at Bayer, looking at the reproducibility of biomedical research, not just in cancer, but across different indications that was not so, you know, drastic, but was still a bit shocking. And so this, uh, amongst other nonprofit initiatives in psychology, machine learning, neuroscience, uh, you know, started to get a lot of attention around reproducibility. And so at that time, uh, I was still a grad student, still looking under the microscope at cells dividing. Uh, I did what I was doing kind of on the side and what a lot of academics do, I, I wrote a paper. Uh, and in this paper, I proposed this new metric or this new measure of scientific veracity, which we called the R factor. Uh, and funnily enough, I, I published this on uh, actually a precursor, I'd say to a lot of uh, preprint uh, 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 repositories called the Winor. Um, in this paper, we suggest uh, that we should introduce some measurement of quality of reproducibility of veracity so that people could be rewarded for this. So not just, you know, publishing uh, in, in the best journals and, and getting, you know, the highest citation rates, but really trying to indicate has this study been validated in the literature by others. Um, I would say uh, you know, our, our initial aim or thinking was that we couldn't even do this. And so we suggested that groups like Elsevier, Thomson Reuters, some of these nonprofit initiatives uh, or NCBI do this. Um, ultimately, that's not the case. Uh, we decided to kind of work on this uh, on the side and then, you know, in a, a full capacity. 
And so we have really built, you know, site to make research uh, more reliable. And I think that's important because research doesn't just inform cancer research or psychology. It really informs kind of every aspect uh, of our lives that you can think about. So financial research, policy, social sciences, humanities, all these things, you know, ultimately are grounded kind of in, in research. Um, and so we want to make sure that it's reliable so that we can build off of each other's findings um, and, you know, make more effective drugs, make sure we're, you know, uh, following the right policies in, in terms of how we govern ourselves or in terms of how we live as, as individuals as well. So we also built it to, to make research more understandable. And so I'd say our aim has not just been, you know, it was initially started at reproducibility, but it's broadened a bit since then uh, as we spoke to researchers and as we've, you know, started to develop the tool. And so we think, you know, a part of this reproducibility or, or making research more reliable is, is helping people to understand it. And I think that's increasingly important uh, as there's more and more research, uh, you know, every day than there was previously. Um, and it's increasingly interdisciplinary. And so it can be very hard to understand, you know, these different fields. And I can tell you, you know, I am an expert at chromosome segregation, but if I look at another scientific paper, you know, I'm forced to rely upon a lot of the proxies of quality that, that we have today. Uh, and I would say this was not our, our, our initial ambition, but really it has become that is to introduce this next generation of citations, because I think citations, you know, have a bad rap. They can be taken as this kind of superficial metric, but really, if you think about them, they connect ideas across time. Uh, the prediction of gravitational waves in 1916 was cited by the detection of gravitational waves in 2016, and that's connected through citation. It's connected across fields, disciplines. Uh, and it stands the test of time. And so we want to make this uh, a rich source of information, not just a superficial metric that we kind of glance at. And so to show sight, uh, I like to show the world as it exists without sight. And so those movies directly uh, informed this study. And so this is the main study coming out of my, my PhD. Uh, there I am. And if you go find that study, you can actually go see the movies again. Uh, it was published in eLife. I did my PhD at Virginia Tech. We collaborated with the hospital in Portugal, uh, as well as a lab at the NIH. Uh, it's been cited 62 times, viewed uh, almost 12,000 times, um, and then no annotations, and, and uh, eLife doesn't show alt metrics. And so I highlight these things because this is generally what we look at when we look at a paper, right? Is it in a journal that I trust? Do I know this reputation? Is it a prestigious journal? Is it Cell, Nature, or Science? Is it highly cited? Does it have a lot of views? Does it have a lot of downloads? Has there been a lot of tweets about it? Uh, and so in general, we'll glance at all these things and, and probably make you know, a little bit of a snap judgment, right? It's a thousand citations, okay, it must be pretty good. It must be a seminal work, 500 citations, et cetera. And I would say you know, that's how we use citations, so quite superficially. And I think that's a big missed opportunity because behind these 62 papers, behind this list of articles, uh, is very valuable contextual information. There could be people interpreting the study, helping you understand it. There could be people criti uh, critically discussing it, critiquing it, supporting it in the same system, a different system, or challenging it with, with competing evidence. And so you don't know that information unless you open 63 documents, scan it, and find what they've said about the article. And that is really entirely impractical, even at the level of 63 documents, because it would be hours of work to do so. And so consequently, you know, we are using studies that are backed by you know, evidence, data analyses, connected directly to the article of interest, we're kind of ignoring them, right? Or we're not using them as efficiently as possible. And so with Cite, we want to change that. Uh, and we're doing that by showing primarily the citation context. And so here is my article through the lens of Cite. And what you can see is that instead of just showing the citing metadata, so this paper cites it, we show this citation context. And so the citation context, these three sentences, uh, were excerpt uh, taken from the full text of the citing article. And so you can read exactly, you know, how are these papers conversing with one another, really? And so this one says, in agreement with previous work, uh, and then cites my study, Nicholson et al., the trisomic clone showed similar aberrations, albeit to a lesser extent, supplemental figure as to be. And so presumably most people on this call have not read my study, but now you're able to see that there was subsequent research in 2018 published in Molecular Biology of Cell by these authors, there's no self-citation flag, so by an independent group, saying that they found uh, you know, similar uh, aberrations. And so that 
can be used to help you assess, to understand, uh, and discover you know, relevant research. Uh, and so we show the citation context, we show where it comes from. So this excerpt of text comes from the results section, and then we provide a citation type indicating if it provides supporting or contrasting evidence. And I would repeat that, that it's supporting or contrasting evidence. It's not just positive or negative sentiment. And so there's a higher bar to get a supporting citation than saying, I like this paper or something like that. Um, and I think one thing that we've also tried to emphasize a lot more is that, you know, it's not just about supporting or contrasting citations, but also about where citations come from and how often they're made. And so you can see uh, that my paper has been cited nine times in the introduction section of other papers, two times in the method section, uh, 13 times in the discussion section. And I think, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to appreciate that a citation made in the methods section is quite different from one made in the discussion section, which is also quite different from one made in the introduction section. And so we're really trying to show, you know, this citation context in a variety of different ways uh, so you can better understand how uh, uh, an article has been cited, how a researcher has been cited, how a journal has been cited, even how an idea has been cited. So you can search uh, our billion cit citation statements to see what does the literature say about X, and X can be anything uh, from Peppa Pig to, to prostate cancer to, you know, the incidence of the dog flatulence. And so we're not just trying to be, you know, another bibliometrics tool. The new data that we have has really opened up new use cases for this. So really search and discovery and understanding beyond just bibliometrics. And so this is a personal use case of mine, uh, looking at a preprint, and I don't want to cover too much on this because I think this will be covered uh, in, in quite a lot of detail in the next one. Uh, looking at this uh, tweet from Eric Topol. So this was in September 29th of 2021. Uh, he has, I think, 650,000 followers. This is massively amplified. This is a preprint um, and it's making a pretty big claim, right? No significant difference in viral load between vaccinated and unvaccinated, asymptomatic and symptomatic groups. Uh, and so I looked at this preprint. It looks pretty, you know, reliable. It looks like it's from uh, I did kind of what, what I just pointed out, right? It's, it's from researchers at a trusted institution. Uh, you could read it. It had one figure. It didn't seem so complete. Uh, it didn't have any citations at this point because it was brand new. But what we've enabled to do through Cite is to search, you know, not just papers and to look at how one paper has been cited, uh, but to look at claims or, again, you know, reagents or kind of any topic. And so if you have our browser extension, you can highlight a claim on Twitter, on New York Times, on Facebook, anywhere on the web, highlight it, and then search that against our uh, database. And so we have a citation statement search, which at this point is a billion citations or more. Uh, and this will allow you to take a claim or a reagent ID, or really, again, you know, it's kind of fun to break and try and put in some, some crazy search in there to see what does the literature say about that. And so that's what I did. Um, and I kind of had this nice aha moment because if you do that, what you'll find is uh, competing evidence to this. So here's another preprint and they don't cite each other. Uh, showing that actually there was a difference. So 68.6% .6 of vaccinated healthcare workers versus 84.9%. Um, and if you see, this has a supporting citation statement. So if you click that, you'll go and find another paper. And so it's a way to see this conversation that's happening, you know, not just related by citations, but also by topics and ideas. Uh, and so you can look at new papers and again, look at you know, all these preprints, how are they discussing one another? And again, I don't want to get too into that because I think it'll be covered, you know, nicely over this. Um, and so, so how do we do this, right? So how have we built site and, and you know, what is, what's going on behind the scenes? Uh, so there's a couple of things. So one, you know, we need access to the full text uh, of articles. Once we have the full text of articles, they generally come in uh, PDF format, uh, especially if you go back pre 2000, they also come in JATS XML and JATS XML is, is a lot easier to text mine. Uh, but there's some challenges there as well. So in most cases, we're dealing with PDFs. PDFs come in a lot of different styles. There can be individual uh, columns, two columns. There can be citation styles with the names. There can be just numbers. There can be superscript. There can be parentheticals, brackets. There's a lot of different citation styles and formats and PDFs. And so we use a lot of machine learning uh, to identify the in-text citation. So highlighted you know, by these blue lines, take that in-text citation, match that to the reference in the reference section, which again is quite a challenge. Take that information in the reference section, which can vary. It can have a DOI, it can have two authors, it can have a lot of information, abbreviated journals, et cetera. 
take that information and then match that efficiently and reliably against metadata from Crossref or data site. And so that, you know, is just going into taking out the citation context is, you know, 11 different machine learning models with 20 to 30 different features each. Uh, and this has been, you know, worked on in an open source way uh, for about 10 plus years. And so we're building on top of, you know, some of these really amazing tools. Once we have that citation context, so that three sentences, we then have a deep learning model that classifies that statement as providing supporting, uh, contrasting, uh, or mentioning. Uh, and so that the way that we've developed that was as experts, so members of the team with MDs or PhDs across different disciplines, was to read roughly 40,000 different citation statements and say, okay, these are authors are citing this paper because they're supporting it and they have evidence to support it, or they're contrasting it and they have evidence to contrast it, or they're just mentioning it. And so we annotated all these different ways that you know authors cite this and then have fed that to a deep learning model that will classify these citation statements at scale. We also have done this for a holdout set of about 10,000 citation statements, uh, which is aimed to be a reflection of the literature so that we can test different improvements to the model uh, against that. Uh, and I think that's important because, you know, to do this manually at scale would be an enormous monumental effort. It's practically impossible. So, you know, we are now classifying uh, over a billion citation statements from 30 million full text articles. And so to rely upon humans solely to do that uh, would be, uh, uh, probably wouldn't work. And so we have this system where the machine has classified most citation statements, but we also allow humans uh, to, to input uh, if we've made a mistake. And so you can flag you know, next to any citation type and say, this doesn't look like it's supporting, it looks like it's mentioning. That's then reviewed by humans and, and changed you know, generally uh, within a day or two. And so where are we today? So I, I've mentioned this already. We just, you know, as a month ago or so, we, we crossed this 1 billion citation statement mark. Uh, initially, we started, you know, only with, with open access content, but we've moved, you know, more and more to partnering with, with many publishers that I'll highlight. Uh, we now have extracted that from over 30 million uh, full text journal articles. Um, and that provides this quote unquote smart citation information on over 50 million different articles and preprints. And so we have this very comprehensive record. Uh, and even where we don't have the full text, we still have a traditional citation, uh, thanks to the initiative for open citations, which has pushed a lot of publishers into making their traditional references open. Uh, and so this is what it looks like over time. As I mentioned, we're now working with leading publishers to index content that is otherwise not open. Uh, and so we've grown quite a bit uh, and there's still more growing to do. Uh, and I think, you know, really, again, our coverage uh, is quite comprehensive across all dis different disciplines. And oftentimes people say, oh, they don't have anything on this. Uh, and then if you search it, they're, they're quite surprised to find that we do. Um, and so we'll continue to do this uh, by working directly with publishers, preprint repositories uh, and others. Um, and then, you know, another thing that we're doing beyond that is to not just provide this tool that's on the side where you can use site, but to really work with these groups uh, to display this on the version of record, because, you know, we want people reading, looking at, discovering these articles, wherever they are online, uh, to have this contextual, nuanced, uh, rich information. Uh, and so you can see that live on, on archive. You can see that live on 100 plus or 120 plus journals on, on Wiley. Uh, we're live on Royal Society, uh, live on, you know, the American Physiological Society, uh, and we've just recently uh, gone live on PNAS. And so here's, you know, a GIF showing this uh, uh, and showing the citation statements uh, made available on PNAS. And so really this gets to kind of that last uh, slide that I showed of, of trying to introduce this next generation of citation metrics or next generation of citations to provide more nuance, right? I, I think we want to go beyond just here's something you glance at to something that you can really engage, uh, engage with. Um, and so this is, you know, a quote uh, from the editor in chief of PNAS saying that it's been abundantly clear for decades that just counting citations is an incomplete and often misleading way to characterize the contribution of a paper to the scientific literature. And I think that's been recognized for a long time. The challenge has been that it's been hard to do. Uh, and so here's some researchers using site, uh, you know, that have discovered, you know, some papers that they didn't even know were supporting. Uh, and, and oftentimes it can help you get up to speed into new dis disciplines or new research areas, where maybe you don't have a PhD level of knowledge 
to really understand what is being discussed here, who are you know, saying these things and, and how can I better uh, discover and understand this research. And so, as I mentioned, you know, this idea has been floated for some time. Uh, and so here is a paper in 1964 from uh, Eugene Garfield uh, discussing can citation indexing be automated? And very pressingly, he describes adding citation markers that would appear uh, uh, on the published citation index along with the usual citation data. So he gives an example uh, of a few different markers that could be added, such as critique, Mr. X is wrong, data spurious, calamity for mankind. And then he says the intelligent machine, so AI maybe, uh, would examine a new document and generate a critical statement such as rather poor paper. Uh, and so this idea has been floated for, for decades. Uh, I think we're fortunate to be doing it when there was enough content that we could get started on to prototype this out. The tools have advanced enough to handle all these different PDF formats. So the text mining is, is you know, not something that could have been done back in, in the 64 or even probably back you know, 10 years ago. And so the timing of this is right. Uh, and I think you know, we, we've really kind of started to execute on that well. And so most of this uh, work is, is funded through the NSF and NIH. So we've received large grants from the NIH uh, to, to fund this. Um, and that's you know, been critical uh, to growing the team and you know, processing these millions of articles, which is not always cheap. Uh, and I would say, you know, thanks so much again for the time. Uh, and if you do have questions, we'll, we'll can hold these to the end, I guess, uh, and then we can both answer them. But if you have individual questions for me, you can reach out directly uh, or tweet at us uh, via site. And so thanks again for everyone for tuning in. And now I will pass it over uh, to Michelle. Great, thanks, Josh. I'm going to share my screen. Congratulations on all this new expansion. I didn't even know about the PNAS um, agreement, so that's wonderful. I'm so happy to see site uh, all over the internet now. Yeah. So um, I'm very pleased to hear to be here uh, to talk to you all today about site. Uh, Josh already did a great job speaking generally uh, about it and helps. Um, you know, this is this is a tool that for me helps add context to my work, but my perspective is going to be a bit different from what Josh was covering, um, specific to preprints. Um, I am a site super fan. I actually have my mug with, here, with me here today, um, and I hope that today I can uh, convince you as to why. So first, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, so I got my PhD at Brown University in medical science. I used to study epigenetics um, of cancer and exposures, kind of the, the cross-section of epigenetics, cancer and toxicology. Um, and, you know, had my own experiences with publishing and citation um, that I carried through to my career uh, later in scholarly publishing when I joined Research Square. When I joined this company, it was not Research Square. It was a company that may, many of you may have heard of called American Journal Experts or AJE, which is a manuscript services company. That's how we started out. I started out as, a, as an editor um, for English language uh, improvement in manuscripts. And later on in my career, I ended up getting involved with the creation of a new platform for post, uh, for pre-publication sharing of papers. We didn't call it a preprint server at first. Later on, we uh, realized that this is the only terminology that people really understand. And so it became the Research Square preprint platform pictured here. Um, and later on, I became the editor in chief of this platform starting out uh, at first within operations and moving into editorial. So now my experience with publications and citations is kind of meta. Uh, now I write about the topic of scholarly publishing. So um, it's an example of my very recent um, publication on retraction of, of preprinted research. So this topic of reproducibility, uh, research integrity is very close to my heart, something I think about a lot. Um, and of course, in the context of preprints. So that sets the stage. Oh, and sometimes I go on podcasts. So um, if you follow me on Twitter, um, then you'll uh, get some access to uh, you know, more explanation of the things that I do and what, what my day to day life at work is like. So just to, uh, I don't want to assume that everybody uh, is on the same page knowing what a preprint is. I'm going to, most of you already know about the medium, uh, but I want to take it for granted. So why would somebody choose to 
uh, essentially violate the deeply ingrained uh, mores of publishing by doing this. This is this being sharing a research paper before peer review um, on the author's own accord on a public preprint platform. So to explain that, I borrowed a little a cute, simple cartoon from Sayello. Um, preprints are really about sharing your manuscript on your own terms uh, in order to quickly and openly disseminate new research, new ideas, um, and allow you to get earlier feedback on the work from a global scientific community. But importantly, the date that you post your preprint is the effective date when your research becomes public. Um, it's, it's the, it sets the priority of your work. So this has been a usual medium for people in fast uh, moving competitive fields to relieve some of the pressure of being first and some of the fear of being scooped, for example. So these are some of the motivations that people have for using preprint platforms. And this is a practice that uh, has been a norm in certain fields. So in, uh, in the uh, physics and mathematics fields and computer engineering, this has been kind of a standard practice for a long time. I think physics has been using it since the 90s. Uh, so not new to them, but rather new to the life and medical sciences, which is a lot of the content that, for example, we host on our platform. So this is a, a graph from Europe PMC, just showing the uptake of preprints since 2017. Um, that's when they started indexing preprints. And you can see that it was a pretty, uh, pretty unusual to see biomedical preprints um, in 2017. And they gradually increased in frequency uh, especially through BioArchive um, up until 2020, but then you can see a very particular turning point um, at 2020, and we all know what happened then. Uh, and this is, you know, maybe one silver lining, at least to me, uh, for the pandemic is that it really normalized the practice of preprinting and made it uh, obvious to people why somebody would want to share their results uh, even before peer review. So in 2020, preprints really exploded. Um, and most of the mainstream discussion around them, at least initially, was quite positive, focusing on you know, how much faster the process of sharing information was becoming and how this was going to you know, usher in a new age of warp speed science. Uh, but there were concerns too. So um, concerns about the guardrails being abandoned and about uh, flooding the zone with low quality research and a lot of concern about the potential for disinformation. Basically, low thresholds for posting wrong or fraudulent research on an ostensibly trustworthy platform, something that kind of looks like a journal, something that looks like where you would go to get the only place that you can really go to get uh, the primary literature, valid information about what's going on at a time when everybody was desperate for information uh, that was true about the virus, especially. All right, so at Research Square, um, we, I take these concerns very seriously. I'm not dismissive of them. Um, and like some other preprint platforms, we tightened up our screening processes during the pandemic. So um, this was in hopes of keeping out the truly poor quality stuff. Um, so we had always screened for these items in black here at the, at the top of, a, of my bulleted list. So for ethics and consent statements, pseudoscience, personal identifiers, alarming and dangerous content, of course. Um, but with loads of the COVID-19 preprints flooding in, we had to step up our vigilance, um, especially around these last two items in, uh, in Black, alarming and overblown biased conclusions, potentially dangerous content. Uh, as an example, preprints telling people that they uh, one potential uh, way to address COVID-19 was rectal administration of ozone. Um, this is something that you can actually find instructions for on YouTube. We didn't want it uh, out there and <laughs> having people uh, try to self-administer ozone um, rectally. 
This is not something that we wanted to uh, endorse, especially given that this is not a practice that is common in medicine. And so we will take the extra time to look at papers and make sure that we're not putting something out there that could potentially hurt somebody or hurt a group of people. All right, so, uh, and then I, I've uh, put in red here a uh, practice that we introduced kind of only halfway through the pandemic. Um, this is checking for data availability on COVID RCTs. Uh, after some rough ivermectin papers. So they're getting screened, but they still lack real editorial oversight. And of course they lack peer review, though there are exceptions there I won't get into. Um, and you know, peer review only gets you so far anyway, right? Everybody knows that even peer review cannot safeguard against all research that is wrong or fraudulent um, and preprints don't even do that. So in addition to tightening up screening, our emphasis went toward looking for ways to introduce context into preprints, um, such as the addition of lay summaries um, on preprints that you know, were consistently being misunderstood, and also ensuring that if there was some substantive critique or endorsement of the work somewhere online, that it could be pulled in somehow, linked in some way to the preprint. So we also added a Twitter feed. I know that has a variable value, um, but you know sometimes it can. Uh, if there, if Eric Topol, for example, tweets out your uh, preprint, which has happened a lot for especially during the pandemic, then it's valuable to see that on the actual uh, preprint page, right? So that readers can see everything that's being said online about that preprint. Um, and and last but not least, you know we added citation counters, so dimensions and cite, of course. And you might ask yourself, do preprints even get cited? Uh, well, they do, of course, but I was interested in seeing the bigger picture. So I looked at the data and thank you to Dom at site who provided the data for this chart. I gotta say, even I was pretty astounded by what I found. Both Research Square and Center for Open Science um, preprints get cited, of course, at this point, thousands of times a month, which in itself is pretty impressive given that you know there's been a lot of doubt and skepticism about preprints and whether they should be cited um, but that's what we have so people are citing them uh, but the the preprints that bioarchive and medarchive represented here as CS, CSH which is Cold Spring Harbor uh, laboratories um, get cited now over 20,000 times per month which I'm certain is more than many journals uh, by my math, just my little poking around on site. I think it's even competitive with some mega open access journals. So the answer is yes, they do. So Research Square displays site alongside a number of other metrics um, and badges that are kind of meant to, again, provide some context about really the reception of any given preprint. So you might look at the alt metric attention badge and understand that you know it, this preprint is getting a lot of mentions on Twitter um, or in the media. And you might see that it's been cited by 22 publications um, by looking at dim uh, dimensions badge. But with site, you get a whole different level of resolution regarding where and how this preprint has been cited because it pulls not only the number of discrete citations but also the sentiment of each one of those citations which starts to paint a picture of how the scientific community is regarding this work. Um, and this is why I include cite as one of a handful of trust signals. Uh, this is, I think, a phrase that came from Richard Siever at, at BioArchive. He uses this phrase as basically, these are the bits of context that we can pick up um, to help readers understand whether a given paper is credible in the end, whether it's a paper or a preprint. So here's what site looks like um, in situ on Research Square. Uh, on a particular Research Square preprint, this is one that had, you know, a lot of attention during the pandemic. And you can see um, the richness of information that's offered here relative to like a basic citation count. Of course, um, Josh covered this in depth. This is information that researchers should really care about because a citation alone, of course, is not always an endorsement. Uh, sometimes people are calling out papers whose results contradict their own. And more often than not, they're just referring to them neutrally. 
So when they do exist, um, you know, when, when there are confirmatory citations that exist, that is something to pay attention to, because it might say something about the validity or the replicability of the study. You really have to look at the citation in order to know for sure. So I wanted to show a couple of case studies here, um, both from the pandemic, um, both from pandemic preprints, of course. So this one came very early on in March uh, 2020, when we all had, you know, just started using masks regularly, and there was a lot of debate as to their effectiveness um, in blocking the transmission of the virus. And this paper was getting a lot of attention online, just to, you know, given the importance of the topic and we ended up working with the author to create an infographic. We thought this topic is really important. We got to get it out there and make it really accessible to people. So we worked with, with them on an infographic graphic that you can see on the left here um, and ended up getting published in Nature Medicine really quickly. I mean, I show the timeline here on the right. So you can see that, of course, during the pandemic, that that uh, cadence of, of publication was really sped up. People were fast tracking these kinds of papers to try and get the, the information verified and out there as quickly as possible. But what we saw was that citations started to accrue to the preprint literally within days and weeks of it posting. So this is just, uh, this is just a smattering of them. A lot of the papers referencing it this quickly were actually preprints themselves. Um, this is a few examples, all of these citations that I'm showing here are pre are from preprint servers. So of course with site, you could see not just the fact of those citations, but with a simple click where they were coming from and in what light they were discussing the paper. So it was really fascinating to essentially watch science communication literally speeding up before our eyes, because of course, this sort of cadence of citations was unheard of before this. Um, and so now you have, even before the official publication of the paper, some trust signals to allow you to form an opinion on the credibility of the work. This is another case study, this last one. Um, this is a preprint that came to us in April last year, 2021, um, right after the initial panic, you'll all remember about the thrombotic uh, event, thrombosis events that were happening following the AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, for some minority people. And here, uh, this is one of these cases where I ended up on the phone with the author, you know, over a weekend saying like, I'm nervous about this because, you know, we're, we're essentially now we're putting, we're putting the nail in about this is actually, a, this is not just an anecdotal thing. We, they're saying, we now understand it. We know that it, it is the vaccine causing this event. And now we think we have an idea of why. Um, this, of course, makes me nervous because this is a time where we're trying to get people, uh, you know, to get, we're trying to get the world vaccinated and get this thing under control. And so anything that casts any doubt on vaccines is going to be a little bit of a concern, especially for a preprint server when we're trying to avoid, you know, putting misinformation out there. So it's like, you know, help me out here. Let's put um, an editorial note on the preprint, make sure that people know. Um, you know that you're not <laughs> dissuading trying to dissuade people from getting the vaccine you're saying we now understand what's happening here and we can actually take some action around it. Um, so, all right, so this study is working toward an explanation for what's going on so we can get ahead of it and minimize the risk. And uh, this one also ended up getting published in New, uh, New England Journal extremely quickly. But despite that, a surprising number of citations accrued to the preprint. And with Cite, I could see that one of them actually used the findings about the mechanism to uh, uh, the mechanism around the, the disorder to successfully treat the same condition. You can see that publication up here on the right. Um, and then you'll see that as time went on for the journal publication, of course, the paper received a lot more confirmatory citations. This is something that just happens over time. You know, people, it takes time to reproduce it or to, to do corollary studies that end up supporting the findings of this study. Um, and again, growing the level of confidence in the findings of the study. So I'll leave you with this quote um, from the great Ed Young, one of the uh, favorite lines from one of the many beautiful um, op-eds that he wrote during the pandemic. Uh, Science is less the parade of decisive blockbuster discoveries that the press often portrays 
and more a slow erratic stumble toward ever less uncertainty. Um, we don't have many tools at our disposal and certainly very few automated tools speeding up or easing the stumble toward ever less uncertainty. But in my opinion, that's exactly what site has been. Uh, so thank you, Josh, um, and, and to everyone on the site team for, for this beautiful software. And, and thank you for listening. Yeah, thanks so much for that amazing talk and for taking the time. Uh, I too also learned more and it's nice to see kind of case studies. I had looked at preprints, uh, you know, anecdotally, just trying to find kind of the citation lag amongst some of them and some we found down to like a few days. And right. so that was really cool because you think of citations generally as, you know, accumulating after months or years and certainly that happens, but to see, you know, in real time, kind of how these preprints are discussing each other within five days, sometimes challenging one another, sometimes supporting, sometimes just referencing it uh, was really powerful. And I often think that, you know, that in itself is a form of peer review, right? That meant the person read it, they engaged with it, arguably, you know, maybe it's even more, they're attaching kind of their name to it. Uh, yeah. And so I think, you know, it really kind of helps what do peers think about this paper uh, and not what do they think behind closed doors that no one can evaluate, but what do they think that you can look at and, and see if there's there's data behind it. Um, and so I think preprint citations and preprints, you know, again, kind of as a source to search from is, is uh, you know, something that will become increasingly, uh, you know, even more so than it is now uh, standard uh, and will be really interesting to follow. So thanks for that. Uh, it looks like we have some time for questions and it looks like there's quite a few questions uh, in the Q&A. So thanks everyone for, for listening in. Uh, I will just read these out loud uh, and then answer them out loud. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A uh, to, to ask them and, and we can keep going. Um, so the first question uh, talks about, you know, how rare contrasting sites are. So I, I use site yet rarely find contrasting sites, even though I know they exist. So this is a great observation, Jack. Um, what we have found, you know, when we manually as humans, so forgetting the, the machine learning model, uh, when we looked at these 50,000 citation statements or this 10,000 holdout set, we found contrasting sites to be quite rare, right? And I think that makes sense if you step back and think about, you know, the publication process, the funding process, the peer review process, and the incentive structure, right? Are you rewarded for challenging your colleague uh, you know, publicly and saying, I found something different. Uh, and so the literature is biased. Uh, there are, you know, it, according to our analyses about, you know, less than 1%, 0.6% are contrasting. Uh, again, I think it's important to emphasize that contrasting is not negative, right? So you can have, you know, a citation discussing a retracted study that could be considered negative, but it's very different from a, a paper that is showing contrasting evidence. And so they are rare. And I think that's a reflection of the fact that you're not rewarded for calling out people. And, you know, oftentimes that's done kind of, you know, uh, uh, away from the publications. And that's one thing we hope to encourage is to get more debate, because I think, you know, it's, it's quite healthy to have debate. Uh, and we'd like to encourage more of it by making it easy to surface and easy to see. Uh, and so they are rare. Uh, so that's a, a good observation. The next question is a, a philosophical question. How does the work you do impact the world at large? Uh, well, I think research, again, you know, informs nearly everything we do. Uh, you can find research, you know, discussing masks, discussing how you raise children, discussing, you know, pretty much anything you can think about. Uh, I think if we can make that more open, accessible, understandable, verifiable, uh, that helps all those different aspects of lives. You know, it makes it easier for other researchers to build upon those ideas. It makes it easier for policymakers to utilize the correct research. Uh, for correct policy, et cetera, et cetera. And so really we're trying to make, you know, what I think is some of the world's most valuable content research publications, more accessible, more understandable. And I would say, you know, with, with uh, Michelle, more, more open, right? Because the big challenge is, is actually being able to, to read these things. Uh, and, and I think, you know, preprints have not only sped things up, they've also, you know, made a lot more uh, open. Um, the next question, how would you cite to help with critical analysis while writing essays and dissertations? Um, so we have a lot of students that use cite, which is a bit surprising to me because I thought it would be more so researchers and grad students, but a lot of students use cite to help uh, with their essays. So oftentimes a student you know, is uh, assigned a paper or a topic to write an essay on and they're supposed to do a critical analysis on this. So they're supposed to discuss you know, competing theories, ideas on this. 
Sight helps a lot because you get to see what have experts said about this paper or this topic very easily. Uh, and then you can sort it, right? You can find a contrasting site for this paper, you know, with a click of a button. Uh, and so it helps in, in a lot of different cases to search through these uh, things. Um, the next question, what research niches are you strong, i.e. many full texts? Uh, and what research niches, uh, research niches are you still a bit weak? So I'd say, you know, historically, we're the most strong in biomedical research, just because a lot of that is open. So there was, you know, PubMed Central, where we could grab 2 million, you know, open articles. Uh, we have, you know, now at this point, public, uh, partnered with 24 different uh, leading publishers, some of them quite large. Uh, and so our aim is to analyze all research articles across different disciplines. We have social science uh, agreements uh, with Cambridge University Press, with Emerald, uh, with some that are yet to be announced. And so we're powerful there. We're also powerful in social sciences. Uh, and I would say, you know, it's, it's sometimes hard to answer. We get this question a lot and there's no like easy baseline to say. Uh, and so with that said, I would also say, you know, we don't have an indexing agreement with Elsevier. So we don't have all of their full text articles, but we have all of their references. And so we have traditional citations mixed with our smart citations in cases. Uh, and generally, and maybe you even notice this from Michelle's talk, and sometimes, you know, there will be, you know, a higher number than ours. Uh, additionally, we're also working with uh, various groups in different geographies to publish non-English articles in there. Uh, and so we won't be able to classify these non-English articles, but we want to make them discoverable uh, because we think that evidence is, you know, valuable, whether it's written in, you know, Greek, Spanish, or, or German, just as much as if it's, you know, in English. Um, this next one, maybe I'll let you answer, Michelle. It says, in the case of preprints, are citations counted even if it is not published? What happens with retracted articles? Is there a message that indicates that it is retracted or is that, uh, or that is a preprint? So um, I think the question is asking whether the preprints are counted. I think this question went in when you were speaking potentially, um, Josh. So you may have mentioned preprints and was wondering if your if preprints are included. Now they probably know that uh, just after my talk that they certainly are. Um, so you see preprints citing preprints and those are all included. I don't know how many of the preprint servers are represented in sites database, but um, probably all if they're all open access, it's easy to access that stuff. Yeah, so so that's that's correct. We do index preprints and I do think you get a lot of valuable information, you know, ahead of kind of the curve, if you will, because these preprints are coming out rapidly and then there's this lag that sometimes can be a year, sometimes preprints are never published. Uh, and they can be highly cited preprints that are never published, which I think is, is really kind of interesting to consider. Um, and then I think, you know, uh, preprint servers like Research Square as well as Site, we clearly show retractions. We also indicate that it's, you know, clearly a preprint. Uh, and so you can filter by retractions, you can filter by uh, preprint uh, as well. And so, you know, we want to give that kind of power and understanding to the user. Uh, this next question and observation says, good arts, Law states when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. Are there risks of site metrics shifting from a measure to a target? How would you counteract this? So this is a great question, uh, and I think yes, there there are certainly risks, right? You know, maybe people will start to write more clearly that they are supporting. Maybe they'll start to support themselves, you know, more. Uh, all these different things, uh, and so we're not trying to say this is the metric to end all metrics. And I think really we try to emphasize that the context is the most valuable part. Uh, but I think, you know, again, like having our metric, like we kind of want that to be a target in some sense, right? We don't want you to say, I need to publish this flashy research and make bigger claims than my data can support uh, to get, you know, highly cited and to get into the selective journal so it can be picked up by the media, right? We want people to be careful uh, because now there can be a contrasting citation, right? So maybe you're encouraged to share that data. Maybe you're encouraged to tell the full story. Um, and, you know, consequently, if you are reproduced and maybe not highly cited, you know, all these things, I think, can be a good thing, right? And so the way to kind of game site, uh, uh, if you will, is to kind of do good research. Uh, but naturally, you know, there are, there can be nefarious characters, there can be challenges. And so we will have to adapt, we'll have to learn. And I think, you know, really, the biggest thing is that it's not just here citation statements that are supporting trust us, it's that you can see it yourself. Because even amongst contrasting or supporting, they can be very different types, right? There can be a contrasting citation statement that says we could not replicate this paper whatsoever. Or there could be a contrasting statement that said we found 25% difference from this study, right? And those are very different. 
Uh, and really it comes down to the human. And so we're not trying to take the human out of that cycle. We're trying to give them kind of superpowers or x-ray vision goggles, if you will. Um, but it's a, it's a good observation. It's something we think about a lot. Uh, this next question, the 50 million journal article used across our, our various disciplines, are all of them open access? No. Uh, so we index, we actually index more content that's uh, subscription based at this point because of our partnerships. Uh, the 50 million refers to how many citations these uh, uh, are linked from, right? So if you look at 50 million different articles, we will have information on them. Uh, and I would guess that most of them are not. Uh, some of them go back, you know, even to the year like 1665 with the Royal Society. And it's pretty cool to find some contrasting citation statements that are, you know, 200 years old. Uh, and I, you know, clearly we've built it, but we look at the PDF and I don't even know how it worked, right? Because some of these PDFs from 200 years old are, are, are you know, it's, it's remarkable that we can text mine that. Um, this next question, what is the main purpose of site? I think, you know, again, to, to make uh, research more understandable, more reliable, and, you know, to introduce this next generation of citations. It certainly helps conduct a research on literature review or conduct literature reviews. Uh, because you get a lot of digestible information that you can use to contextualize this paper or to discover new papers. Uh, and so I can look up, you know, kind of any topic and, and really kind of quickly come up to speed and say, all right, here's what's happening in that field. Here's who, you know, is supporting this, who's contrasting this, who's written the most on this, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this next one, if one puts up the preprint on site, can they publish with an old school publisher? So to be clear, we are not hosting preprints. We're indexing and analyzing them. So we take them from hosts like Research Square, uh, analyze them, and then extract out those citation statements. Uh, and I would say that yes is the short answer, that you can publish with quote unquote old school publishers. Uh, this, I think, you know, took a little bit of kind of uh, growing pain. So initially publishers, you know, maybe you shouldn't cite this. No, we don't want to publish that because it's already been pre-printed. Uh, but the community has really kind of advocated for allowing preprints to be published, you know, formally with, uh, with traditional publishers. Uh, and I can't think of a single publisher that doesn't allow them at this point. Uh, there were some holdouts, but uh, again, you know, the community said this is ridiculous. This is, you know, uh, good for science. And so we want to, to encourage that. Um, here's another question. You mentioned self site during your presentation. It was a pleasant surprise because I had been using the visualization map before to have a glimpse of self citations as a hallmark of possible fraudulent predatory publishing. Sadly, I'm just trying now. So I think this is an interesting thing. So self citations, uh, we do have because, you know, me supporting myself versus a group, you know, independent supporting is, it can be different. But what I've also kind of found really interesting about self citations is those self citations that are contrasting, right? And so contrasting is not a negative thing that you should avoid at all costs. And some people might write into us and say, uh, you know, I don't, none of my work's ever been contrasted. And, you know, I think people should think maybe more than 15 seconds before saying that, because think about that, right? You have never publish something that has been contrasted, including by yourself, right? You should be growing, understanding, changing your thinking. This is what science is supposed to be. It's not about publishing trophies that you defend at all costs and, you know, kind of used to promote. And so what I found is researchers that self-contrast their previous work, I really tend to trust them, right? They are saying we found a difference uh, in our previous study and they're acknowledging that versus someone that's kind of ignoring it and have said these things. And so I think it's, you know, it's not that supporting is good, contrasting is bad, this one-to-one -one relationship. I think it's, you know, trying to make all this information more accessible to researchers and individuals and humans uh, to, to understand. Um, and so I do think though, however, this could be used, right? Like if you're looking at uh, self-citation rates that are exorbitant, like 90% of a paper, right? That could indicate fraud. Uh, and we do have a reference check that starts to show some of this. We haven't like quantified that, uh, but I think that's that's something we could start to look at. Um, uh, on, there's a question about a premium feature. So site is not free. We are trying to build, you know, a, a sustainable business, and we charge uh, for access to to site. Uh, with that said, you know, we do give free trials to universities, uh, and we work with individuals generally to to set those up. And so, you know, we want site to be as accessible as possible, while you know making sure we can still keep the lights on. Uh, and so, you know, if you are at a university, please encourage your librarian to reach out to us uh, and we can set up a free trial. And we think it's pretty affordable, you know, if that trial is successful, 
uh, especially compared to, to, to some other tools. Uh, another question, is the code freely available? The code is uh, partially available, it depends. So we've written a paper actually published describing in detail the precision, the recall scores, uh, making uh, various aspects of code available. So the processing of PDFs is available. Uh, this one code base called Glutton, which matches that reference string against metadata is available. Pretty much everything's available. We use a, a deep learning model called Cybert, also available. Uh, our training data is not fully available. Um, and that's just because, you know, we, we again, don't want to kind of give this away to, to large competitors that we deal with. Uh, but we try to be as open as possible so you can access this. And if you go to site and go to the resources section, you can find that paper. It's open access, so you can read it. Uh, and it will link to the various repositories for the code. Um, and so again, you know, this is another question asking about the performance of the classification model. Uh, again, that's in the paper. Very generally, uh, the precision score of uh, uh, contrasting and supporting is higher than 0.8. So it's 0.8 and 0.85, uh, meaning, you know, if we present you about 10 uh, of these different classifications, eight are going to be true. Um, again, also, you know, it's not perfect and it's never going to be perfect. Uh, it's critical that you can read that citation context yourself and you can provide feedback into the system. So we have humans correcting some of these things uh, and not just correcting it for themselves, but correcting it for you know, all users of the platform. Uh, how do you decide what type of citation it is? So yeah, again, this uh, is looking at you know, a lot of different things. It, it's a challenge. It's looking at the structure of the sentence, where that uh, citation statement came from. So, you know, supporting citations are generally not in the introduction. Those are more so mentioning in passing, but they'll be in their uh, discussion or results, uh, et cetera. Uh, and so again, this is really looking at the rhetorical function and it's been trained on, uh, uh, you know, roughly 40,000 uh, manually annotated citation statements. And so it's, it takes into account like 10,000 different variations of each word, the structure of this, the sentence, uh, and there can be challenges, right? There can certainly be challenges with, you know, even just segmenting sentences because scientific papers have a lot of scientific notation in it. Uh, they have, you know, a lot of different uh, formats, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this next question, a major value is the ability to see snippets of full text that provide citation context, especially in cases when you don't have subscribed access to the entire article. However, I'm wondering what one can do to convince faculty and researchers that the time to learn cite saves them time, i.e. they may ask, why wouldn't they just look at the citing articles without the contextual snippets? Is the additional time to learn cite going to pay off versus just doing what they already do? So I think what cite is introducing is, is something new, right? Like I, as a grad student, didn't look at a paper and then look at 60 citations, right? And clearly I like and care about citations. So I think people just don't really engage with citations, maybe when they're doing literature reviews and things like this, but I think they're used very superficially and I think they're used mostly as numbers, right? Okay, that paper has been cited 500 times. There's no way I'm gonna open 500 papers and see what they've said. But with cite, it's because it's so easy to do, uh, it's almost like a new workflow, right? You can now look at a preprint, you can now look at a paper and in a click of a button and you know, looking very quickly at dozens, you can search through them, you can see what these contextual snippets say. Uh, and so it saves massive amounts of times. And really I would say kind of introduces something entirely new. And for fun, I've tried to time myself, you know, going through traditional citations, opening it, finding what it says. Uh, and you know, the quickest you can do it is like a minute or two per citation. With cite, you know, obviously that's instantaneous, right? You click it and you see that citation context. And so it's hard to really compare, but if you compare those, you know, it, it saves huge amounts of time uh, and it uncovers a lot of valuable information that is often really just overlooked. Uh, and so, you know, again, that's, that's really kind of why cite started is trying to get this kind of insider information that's very valuable, that's varied amongst this avalanche of citations and to make it uh, accessible. Um, I'll try to go a bit faster because there's uh, some more questions. How much does it cost? If you go to our pricing page, you can see that for individuals. Uh, and then for, for universities, that depends upon the size. Uh, again, we try to work with universities to make that uh, quite uh, affordable. Um, the next question, can you find a contrasting statement only when it is a citation sentence and not when it is an original claim? Um, so I think yes is the answer to this. So you can search our entire database and you don't even just have to use our citation types. You can put, you know, use powerful searches with exact match to say, we could not replicate in quotations. So you're going to find people that wrote directly, we could not replicate. And then you can use whatever term after that you want. 
And so you can kind of use, you know, whatever you think is a, a classifier, just Boolean operators and searches to search through our billion citation statements and then set alerts for that. And so it doesn't just have to be, uh, you know, um, looking at uh, uh, papers or individual things. And I would say, you know, again, a paper can cite another paper multiple times. It can contrast one part and it can support another. So one paper can have a supporting and a contrasting citation statement from the same paper. Uh, and so we are looking at claims. We don't assess what is the main claim of this study or what is the minor claim. We're just showing those different things. Um, this next one, what happens if a paper is checked for plagiarism and it is existing as a preprint? Uh, do you wanna take that one? Um, oh. Yes, so this this happens quite a lot, actually. Um, a lot of people don't have, or you know, some more obscure journals maybe ha are not up to date on the fact that preprint servers exist, and so they'll come up with a similarity match. Um, I can't speak to what happens globally, but at Research Square, this is something that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, and our support staff actually reach out to the journal to explain what a preprint server is, uh, that it really shouldn't be considered uh, plagiarism. This is basically an identical. Uh, paper to what was submitted to the journal. And that almost always resolves the issue. Uh, but of course, as Josh said, there are still a few holdouts um, that don't that don't like this kind of violation of the Inglefinger rule and, and want to stick to um, think only things that haven't been published in any form before. Thanks for that. And I, I think, yes, I mean, sometimes I've seen these on social media and it's, it's kind of silly, right? Uh, and uh, but I think it still shows a lot of work that we have to do around preprints. And so there has been an explosion, but there is still you know, a massive amount of people that are unaware of these, including you know, editors. Um, hello, Marla from Geneva. Uh, from your experience, do you need to cite cite in your literature review or elsewhere? You don't need to, we would appreciate it. Uh, and so we do have a paper that is on our resources section um, and it's pretty fun. You can use cite to search cite. And so we have an alert that we see when people cite us and how they cite us. Uh, and we regularly share data and do some analyses with bibliometric researchers for larger ones. Uh, and so, yes, hopefully, you know, it'll be interesting to see how site, our paper describing site has been uh, shared over time. Um, and again, that's if you go to our, our homepage and go to the resource section, it'll say how does site work and that links directly to the paper. This next question, uh, so looking at the Eugene Garfield paper that I, I linked to, uh, it discusses that there's quite a famous inventory of reasons to cite that go beyond confirming or contrasting previous sources. Do you think in the future, the development of more advanced deep learning algorithms could capture the nuances of Garfield's classification? So this is a really great quest question, right? So mentioning are not all the same in our bucket. They could be a lot of different things. Uh, and so, you know, I don't think it necessarily has to be deep learning. So we have citations by section. And again, you know, citation appearing in the method section versus introduction section. There's no deep learning to classify those things, but those are different types already. And so we try to kind of emphasize beyond just supporting and contrasting that you can also look at you know, the sections and you can also search them. And so I do think there, there is more work that we're doing. I do think there can be more automated typing though in, in the future. We try to not do all of it at once because I think it can be confusing. It can be a challenge for us. It took years to build up that training data. Um, and so we also, you know, what would we do? which ones are kind of more valuable? Should we do critiques or is that too much opinion, not enough evidence? You know, these are things that we would probably do in co consultation with, you know, the community. One thing I can say that I think is interesting is that, you know, again, and this doesn't require deep learning, one paper can cite another paper 10 times throughout it, right? It can cite an introduction 10 times. And that engaged type of citation is very different from a citation where it's just mentioned in passing, you know, because everyone cites this. And so looking at these engaged versus passive citations by looking at the number of citation statements made, uh, again, doesn't require deep learning, but I think is an interesting signal and something that we're starting to look at is, you know, which are papers are really being engaged with versus which ones are just kind of mentioned in passing. And if you go to the reference tab on any site report, you'll see up top the most engaged reference. So the one that had received the most citation statements. So it's, it's really kind of powerful to see this is a paper that influenced this paper that I'm reading. So it's not just looking at citations to it, but it's looking at citations you know, from it. Um, and then the last question, and, and thanks Michelle for staying a bit longer. Uh, what is your take on how site may affect, influence, replace the need for meta-analysis? Uh, so I think it will you know, enhance the meta-analysis. I think it, we're not going to replace this. I think there are people trying to automate these things. Uh, you know, I think site can automate this in some sense. Uh, but I think, you know, really we're trying to enhance what people 
do through, through most of you know, our, our workflows. And so we build it in that case. Uh, and I think it can be dangerous to rely solely upon kind of just the numbers and just metrics. Really, it's you know, a workflow tool that helps you know, students, researchers, policymakers, really kind of anyone interested in research better discover and, and understand it. Um, okay, so thanks. Uh, thanks everyone. That is probably the most questions that we've ever had at one of these. Uh, and so I really appreciate that. I appreciate all the comments in the chat as well. Um, this will be posted, and so we'll we'll share this, you know, as a follow-up email, and then we'll post this on our YouTube shortly. Uh, so thanks so much, uh, and I hope you all have a, a nice rest of the day. Thanks a lot, Michelle. My pleasure.